welcome to my stream. Hope you're all having a great day today. Uh, going to check and make sure that the sound is coming through okay here. I'm not hearing my sound, but I think I might just have it not on. So if anyone has any uh, feedback on the sound, let me know. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about some game feel today. So my plan was to wait a few minutes, let people get settled, uh, say hi to people as they start to enter, uh, then go into my topic and leave some time at the end for questions. Also be answering questions over the course of the stream. Uh, sounds good. Awesome. Thank you so much, friends. Yeah, I wish I could hear it through my thing, but that's fine. Not worried about it. Uh, yeah. So first off, I guess, how is everyone doing today? Erica, I'm just putting my oldest to bed. Be right back. Sounds great. Excited to have you here. Excited to be doing, doing a chat. Uh, yeah, game feel. Game feel is something really interesting to me. I did the girls game shelf video about it. It was really the first time I kind of put into words what I was thinking about, what I mean when I say the word game feel. And it's something that's kind of been rattling around in my head, kind of an amorphous blob that I've been zhuzhing into shape and feeling the outside boundaries of it. It's like, what is this? What am, what am I trying to say when I talk about how a game feels? Uh, what does it mean? What's it important? Why is it important? These are all things I'm excited to talk about today. Yeah, just gonna wait a few minutes, uh, let people get settled before we go dive right into it. Um, yeah, and the way that I'm positioning this topic is in a very exploratory way. So I'm going to be putting a lot of thoughts out there, very welcome to getting pushback or feedback on any of the things that I'm saying, uh, open to questions over the course of it. Cause I have a lot of stuff, took a lot of notes, wrote a lot of stuff down for what I wanted to say about the way that games feel. Uh, but I also want to come back and refer to things as people are popping in and out and clarify things. I also go over, I'm going to talk about quite a few different games uh, over the course of the hour. And there's so many board games out there, I'm sure that um, some people may have heard of the games I'm referencing, some people may not have. Uh, I like to give a little detail about each game, um, just so people know what it is, if they haven't heard of it before. Uh, and definitely I find it frustrating people just like oh you know uh, cosmic encounters you know what that's like it's like no I don't actually know what that's like I don't know what that reference means uh, so I think it's important to be inclusive uh, and explain references so people know but if I don't go into it enough or if you miss the part about what the game is always happy to go back and deal with things all right I think we're ready I think we're ready to get started here I'm excited and this is also going to be, I believe, on YouTube. I'm going to download this so you will be able to come back and watch it and reference it. Uh, so it's fun and exciting. And yeah, let's just, let's dive in. Let's get to it. All right. So what is game feel? Uh, I want you to hold that in your mind for a moment uh, before I dive right into defining it from my own perspective. Just sit with that for uh, a little bit and if I were to ask you for example a game that you'd worked on or a game that you designed a game that you've played maybe how did it feel to play that game uh, what would your interpretation be of that statement uh, and what kind of ideas would that inspire uh, as I mentioned when I was just getting started I I'm one of the reasons I'm most excited to talk about this is because I feel feel right I feel like there's not enough language around this in the board game design world I think we talk a lot about mechanics we talk a lot about theme uh, is the game fun is it satisfactory to play so there, there, we have some words to describe 
uh, the feelings, the experience, or the emotion that a game creates, but uh, but not enough, you know. There, and I think part of it, uh, a lot of us, I know for me, I come a little bit more from a hobby background. The hobby background and the mass market ba background are a little bit separated out, so you usually either been in one sphere or the other sphere. Uh, if you come from a more hobbyist background, then yeah, a lot of the designers there, a lot of the design diaries don't dig too much into that. They're, you know, talking about the math of a game. You know, I have 10 cubes and then I can get 15 cubes if I move over here. Uh, talk about the phases, even think of, consider a rule book, right? When you're reading the rule book, often they don't go too much into the experience you're expected to have. We'll just dive right in to set up, right? The first thing in a rule book. Sometimes you get a nice flavor section in there, but often it's just like set up. Here's where you put the pieces. Here's where you do the cards. Okay, I have the cards now. Uh, and it doesn't really give you a lot of time or space to settle into the experience of the game. So as I'm trying to feel this out and I appreciate you all being with me to bounce some ideas off of, uh, as I'm thinking about game feel, here are some of some example questions that come into my mind. When I'm playing this game, any particular game, do I feel powerful or do I feel powerless? Do I feel calm, relaxed in the game, or do I feel activated? I'm going to be very expressive here because I think it helps to communicate what I'm talking about. Do I feel like I'm directing the game, like I'm a god, maybe? in charge of all the things that are going on? Or do I feel like the game is directing me and maybe I'm pulled along in a direction? Do I feel frustrated? Do I feel excited? Do I feel sad? Do I feel angry? Do I feel bored? Uh, do I feel hopeful? Or do I feel scared? Uh, feelings can come across as actions. Does the game make me laugh? Does it make me shout yes or no? Or does it make me recede into my own mind and sit like this? for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes. Before we get too far into it, I want to steer the conversation away from adding value judgments to feelings. So I, all those things that I mentioned when I said scared or sad or excited, uh, our tendency is to think of those as good and bad, to put them into black and white, right? To put them into boxes. Uh, so I think it's important to not label them as good or bad. Games can inspire all sorts of feelings and experiences, and players desire all sorts of feelings and experiences. Uh, for example, um, Holding On is a game where you're, uh, a, char a character is in hospice and you're taking care, Billy Care, you're taking care of that character and they're eventually gonna die. So that's, you know, a game that was intentionally designed that has a very sad potential feel to it. Um, Travis Hill designed a game called The Wait, which is about, again, waiting for someone to pass on. So there are many games and much potential design space for all sorts of different emotions and experiences. Uh, and I'm excited to see more of those places better explored. I would say the one important thing with that is to set expectations for your game. Uh, and I think this is important with role-playing games, with any sort of a game, you can create any sort of experience Nothing is really off limits, but you need to communicate that up front because some people are comfortable with some experiences and not others. So explore experiences, but be communicative what what you're doing. Um, also understand game feel and experience is what happens when components and mechanics uh, come into contact with messy and unpredictable humans. So you can't always predict how people will feel about your games. You might say, uh, to someone that, oh, my game is a very happy game, it's a very fun, silly game. But some people might experience it as that, and some people might not experience it as that. So you can design with intentions of creating certain feelings and experiences, but you have to be aware that there's a lot of stuff going on that may impact how the final experiences are experienced. Hello, Helena, thanks for joining us, glad to have you here. <laughs> Pam, I miss this one. Grizzled always makes me feel sad and defeated unless we happen to win, but hopeful. That's great. I think the fact that Grizzled is supposed to, uh, is effective in communicating that, because uh, it's a wartime game, right? Where you're trying to manage your emotional resources. Um, and, and yeah, I think 
the fact that board games are interactive means that we can do some really cool stuff with them. Uh, yeah, so next up, as you investigate game feel, uh, here's another very important thing. Uh, it's important to be aware of context, culture, and bias. So not only the individual experiences of individual players, but the larger context into which your game is placed. Uh, Amari O'Keel came out with a very great uh, post about his game Wrath Gods, in which he talked about beef and how some designers push back a lot on that mechanic, but it actually was very strongly rooted in his cultural background. So uh, this is something, again, that I think that we're not aware of enough and we need to be more aware that no matter how we've designed it, we might design it a certain way, we might play test it with a certain group of people and they're having the intended experience, but then we might move it to another group of people, uh, whether that's uh, gender, whether that's race, whether that's age, uh, culture, location, and those people might have a different experience. So all important things to keep in mind. All right, so I'm going to break down experience, game feel into four different aspects. Can go through them one at a time. Those aspects are game feel and tone slash aesthetic, game feel and mechanics, game feel and theme, and then game feel and shifting experience. So let's start off, dive right into game feel and tone slash aesthetic. I would say tone and aesthetic aren't things that we really discuss much in the board game world, board game design world, which is really surprising to me. Uh, often, if your game is being published by someone other than yourself, tone and aesthetic uh, might be something that the publisher determines. You know, the publisher might put another uh, put another flavor onto your game. I almost said theme there. We're going to get to theme a little bit later. But you might have made your game and said it was going to be really goofy and silly, and they might not change that many mechanics, but make it into more of a dark, serious experience. Um, tone and aesthetic have a huge impact, maybe the biggest impact, on the feeling or experience that your game will generate. So I think it's very important to consider those things as you're designing the game and prototyping the game and as much as you can uh, to make a product that really captures the experience that you're going for, try and play around with that as you're designing. So some things that will inform the tone and aesthetic. Art style. Is it realistic? Is it cartoony? Do you have bright colors or do you have dark colors? Uh, what kind of language is used in the rule book? Is it flowery, uh, very elaborate? Is it precise and um, just cut down to the minimum possible words? Is it humorous? Uh, what are the components like? And there's a whole world here, right? Like, are the, is it big dice? Is it small dice? Is it big, chunky, wooden cubes? Is it, uh, do you have meeples in there? What are the cards shaped like? You know, are there hexagons? Are there marbles? Are there things that I can play around with? Uh, and again, it's important to remember that the way that all these different things are interpreted is cultural. Uh, you know, a certain color palette in my culture could be very different, evoke a very different emotional response than a color palette to someone from another culture. Uh, not just culture, but your previous experiences too. You know, that if you grew up with very colorful cartoons, you might have a interpretation of colorful things. Uh, as one who grew up in the same culture who didn't see those cartoons might not have that same experience. So I'm going to go through some games specifically and talk about their tone aesthetic. And again, we're not talking about theme here, which is very different, but just kind of the presentation of the game and how that informs some of the game feel. <laughs> Elena, yes, we don't talk about it enough. Thank you. <laughs> Spelling. What if a publisher wants to completely change the tone of your game? Would that be a deal breaker for you? So I'm going to pause and answer this question. Um, uh, whenever I work with a publisher, I consider it a conversation. I really like working with publishers because I think that back and forth 100% of the time gets the game to a better space, at least in my previous experiences. So I... First, I would choose a publisher that I trusted to make those changes, 
and I would want to understand why they were doing it, if it fit in better with their brand, for example. Um, and part of making sure that you've established that relationship up front is really good. So, for example, when I worked with Game Right, we went back and forth a lot before we signed the contract, and we both had a very strong understanding of what the other person was looking for, or the other party was looking for from the game. So I started out with fruits and vegetables, with faces, and it was adorable and goofy, and that's the Game Right brand, and so I pitched it to them knowing that's their brand. So we were very aligned on that. So I think it is important um, if, I think you should care about the tone and aesthetic of the game. I think you should pitch that game to publishers that share that tone or aesthetic and as you're going through the pitching process, um, going back and forth, listen to their suggestions. And they might have a good reason, you know. You might make a game... What's a good example? Uh, you might make a game about fishing. Everyone loves fishing, right? That's very goofy. You have all sorts of different fantasy fish and catching them. And you do, like, funny moves. And all the moves have funny names. But... Uh, you might find a publisher who wants to make a fishing game that's very realistic, where all the you don't have the fantasy fish, and it's just normal, standard fish, and they want to maybe use a IP or an intellectual property from some fishing company. I don't know, I'm just making all this up on the fly. Uh, and going back and forth, you might decide what's important for you as a designer, uh, that it wasn't the silliness of it, it's just you have this really cool fishing mechanic where you play combo cards and get up to this like really powerful uh, sequence of events after you've played all these cards and that's what's the core of the game and it doesn't matter, um, not that it doesn't matter, but you can make changes to the game that lean more into that serious fishing nature uh, and keep the core what was fun about it. So yeah, always a back and forth conversation there. Fantasy fish. <laughs> Is that a game? It should be. It's alliterative, right? That's that's my brand now. Alliterative games. Got to dig into it. All right. So some examples of tone aesthetic in games to give you a little bit more context. Go nuts for donuts. As I was typing this, I kept typing go newts for donuts. So that gives you a little bit of understanding where my mind space is right now. But anyways, go nuts for donuts! Food with cute faces! I love it! It's unexpected, unusual, and silly. It informs the gameplay of grabbing your favorite donuts and the comedy of slapping donuts out of other people's hands. Uh, again, we're not talking about theme here, because the theme is... <laughs> it's a little generic, right? It's, it doesn't... The mechanics of go nuts for donuts, it wouldn't have to be donuts. It could have been cakes or something. But the aesthetic of it does really push uh, forward that humor, and it works really well with the game. Uh, Takedo. The board is not cluttered. Uh, and Takedo is a game about taking a trip across the Japanese countryside. You're moving your... kind of a little bit like a roll move. You're moving your worker along the track and taking actions. Action selection, I guess would be a good way to describe it. So the board's not cluttered. The art style is beautiful, lots of nature themes, very little text, which is interesting. The cards and the board themselves, only a few words in there, so very uncluttered. Uh, when I see this, uh, and it wouldn't necessarily have had to be a, a road trip, you know, it could have been um, like a trip down memory lane or something. You could change the theme there, but keep the aesthetics and keep that feeling of relaxation and peacefulness. Uh, Eschaton is a newer game you might not have heard of. It's a deck building game with a uh, territory area control element to it, uh, but it's all in shades of gray. So uh, there's pretty, I think there's red, a little bit of red in there too, but there's very little color in the game. And uh, doesn't super matter what the theme is, I think it's like demons or something, but that the darkness of it really reinforces this feeling of um, kind of dreariness and sadness and um, yeah, just, just a world. It's very good world building with just that, that color palette. Uh, just One 
there's there isn't a lot of tone and an aesthetic in just one just one is a party game where you have a little whiteboard and you write words on it and try and make people guess words uh the, the box is colorful and kind of makes feels like a party but the the cards themselves just cards and then your uh dry erase markers and your little uh stand slash palette to write on and it's all very simple and I think what that aesthetic says is that it's a game that relies a lot on the players to input their own uh, their own fun into the game. So there's a very quick rundown of tone and aesthetic in games. Uh, I could go on forever about this but it's kinda you know just art and stuff outside of anything that's not specifically uh, mechanics and theme. All right, let me check the chat. Kirsten says, I've been wrestling with tone in my game. All right, my main thought keeps coming back to target market, yep. Mainly it's answering uh, for family and kids, bright and lighthearted, absolutely. Or more gamers, more artsy and deeper colors, yeah. How much does should market influence tone and aesthetic? Uh, I would say like, 80 to 90 percent. Um, I'm a huge, huge proponent of making your game be a product. Um, and a very important thing about marketing any product is who is the target audience for this. I, I prefer not to use the traditional terms too much for target audience. Like it's not just is it for kids, is it for adults. Um, I hate the whole like is it for men or women thing. Like more, I like to say, um, from a product design background, who is your, uh, you do a, um, I forget what the term of it is, but the, the user story, there we go, the user story for your target audience, you know, what kind of other things do they like to play, where are they going to play this game, um, do they have young kids, do they not have young kids, so kind of picturing a person who would play this game, maybe based on yourself, if you like the game, or the play testers you play with, taking them uh, and looking at them and the kinds of things that they like. So building up this story and fitting your aesthetic to match that. All right, next up is game feel and mechanics. I'm gonna drink some water for my unicorn. I've been talking a lot. All right, so mechanics are the tools that designers most often use to evoke feelings. Uh, for the way board game design works, will publishers can potentially change tone, aesthetic, and theme, but mechanics is usually what we have the most control over. But we don't really dig enough into the granular feelings that our mechanics inspire. We'll look at uh, whether a game is fun, whether it's satisfying, whether it's enjoyable for the target audience, but not necessarily at uh, how the individual choices of mechanics can really have uh, just hard can really inspire targeted feeling like if I have someone draw a card here how will it feel versus whether they roll a dice there um, and kind of getting into the experience curve which we'll get into a little bit later <laughs> oh my gosh I want a unicorn yeah this is like the best cup ever in part because uh, I'm a child sometimes and knock things over so it's a little less likely to spill water everywhere uh, yeah, so let's dig into some examples of how mechanics can inform game feel. Uh, drawing a card, one of my favorite mechanics in a game. Uh, that dramatic reveal, you know, you have that, you kind of wait, you're like, uh, like a uh, face-off in a western movie, right? Like, doo -doo, wah, 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 wah. So there's often an incredible amount of tension when you're drawing a card. Uh, often a single card in a game like Magic the Gathering or a Van at All Artichokes can make or break the game. So the reveal of a card is often um, just really intense, especially in a game where you draw one card per turn. There can be a lot of power in that. So that's it's a very activating sort of a feel. Uh, how about rolling a dice? So you're using your physical body as a randomizer. There's a very gestural action to rolling a dice, and that makes it a little bit different than drawing a card. Uh, also, a lot of games that have dice rolling have a lot of dice rolling. So it's 
maybe not as impactful. Uh, you can still, you know, roll a one. We all know that that's a very bad thing. Or crit, crit miss, crit hit. Uh, roll a 20. So rolling dice can be very dramatic. And there's that roll. There's kind of the held breath feeling. Uh, waiting for the dice to resolve. So there's a, a physical thing there. Um, creating the randomization yourself. But it's a different feeling, right? There's a little bit of a different experience to your rolling dice versus drawing a card. Uh, let's talk about collecting things. Collecting cards, collecting cubes or the components. Anyone who likes to stack things like I do really knows this experience. Uh, any game where you're getting stuff over time, often into your tableau, right? You're building out this empire, uh, can really create a feeling of building wealth and choice and options. Like it can be a very uh, heartening, solidifying thing over time. You know, like I have all this stuff. Uh, maybe I might not win the game, but at least I built up, um, I built up my savings. You know, there, there's a very uh, obvious feeling to that. Uh, so using clues to figure something out, you know, using your, your brain to figure out, or maybe you'll uh, use, look at different words on different cards and connect different abilities. It's like the, like the map connecting the points and, you know, figuring out the mystery. Uh, there's a very um, mental, very satisfying to, to people who are skilled at it, you know, and enjoy kind of just thinking and ruminating and saying like, okay, well, uh, even just one, I guess, would have this feeling. It's like, okay, those are the clues. And I know what that person had this experience. And yeah, just like pulling the pieces together. Kind of a puzzle thing, right? It's a little bit similar to the feeling you get from putting together a puzzle. Uh, and last but not least, shouting out answers for charades or word slam. You know, like pizza, uh, uh, sauce, uh, t tomato sauce, uh, the meatball. Uh, and that is... It's a very social feeling. Uh, it's a very it's a perform it's a performance feeling, right? Every time you do that, you are uh, having a voice, being present in a space with other people. So that is a very different feel. All of these different uh, mechanical elements that I have described inspire very different. Uh, experiences, emotional responses, and there's hundreds, if not thousands, of these elements, right? And these are all building blocks that connect together to create the whole emotional experience of your game. I love a good reveal, I know, I'm just like, Wicha! and then you make the face, you're like, oh wow, this is a really good one. All right. Up next, we have game feel and theme. I'm not gonna go too much into this one because I think that theme often becomes a trap for game feel, in part because many games theme is an afterthought or it changes over time. Uh, this is one of my big frustrations with game design is there aren't enough games that really capture the feel of the theme that they're putting forth, you know? Uh, I think this is really a huge space for growth in games, and I'm just really excited in the future to have a weaving game. Uh, I know there's knitting, Arch Ravelry, I haven't had a chance to play that yet and see if it really captures the feeling of knitting something, but you know, I've, if you've ever woven on a loom before, right, you have your warp and your weft, and you're kind of going along and doing this thing, and you pull the thing down and then you go back and it's this just rhythmic feel to it. So just really capturing that or capturing the feeling of uh, sailing a boat, you know, the moments of relaxation and tension. Um, I would say Formula Day is, does a pretty good job of, of capturing the feel of using bigger and bigger dice as you shift your engine up. Uh, it's basically a roll and move, really, right? Uh, but you're competing, racing other people with cars, and you're pushing your luck to try and like go really hard into this corner, but your car might blow up. Uh, so I'm going to go over a couple of, uh, I guess one theme that I think really does work and some themes that don't work as well for capturing the essence of the feel of the game. Uh, Quirky Circuits, I love. It's a cooperative game by Nikki Valens. 
that uh, you are controlling, you are collectively controlling a Roomba. <laughs> Basically what it comes down to. And you're all putting, you're programming. Uh, so you're putting down a bunch of cards. You don't know what cards other people put down and then you reveal them and very much like an actual Roomba, uh, you're like, okay, we'll just clean up all the things on the floor. And instead you go like bump into the wall, turn around, bump into the wall, turn back, bump into the wall. Uh, and the theme really captures that Roomba feeling. In contrast, if you look at a lot of heavy Euro games, you're trading in the Mediterranean or building a distribution network we after having played enough of these games and building up a little bit of a mythos behind it in the hobby game industry we know the experience that these games will deliver you know this is a game where it's going to take a while to grok the rules there, there's going to be a lot of little sub rules that i'm going to have to learn and remember uh, I'm going to have a lot of things going on, moving things from place to place. Uh, but for a lot of these games, it doesn't matter if it's if you're in Greece or if you're on the moon, right? It's the, the, kind of the same experience with the, the theme just there. So I think theme has the potential to incredibly inform how a game feels, like the what about a game that feels like to pet a cat or to be a cat knocking things onto the floor or a game that it feels like to write a book, you know? Really, there's so many experiences, real world experiences that we have as humans that we either haven't tried to put into an interactive game experience or we've tried and it's fallen a little bit short. I think one of the tricky things there is uh, the language, the tools and languages we have to work with board games, there are some limitations there, especially making it not so finicky and granular that we have to um, have a lot of rules that the game is very complex to get into. So the tricky part is keeping it um, lightweight enough that you really, that the rules of the game fall away and you're just having this experience that you're trying to communicate thematically. There's a lot of challenge there. Uh, I think there's innovation that can be done in this space to capture those things uh, more succinctly. All right. Last in our list of four things, I have game feel and shifting experience. So even when tone mechanics and theme of the game are the same, the experience can shift wildly depending on who plays the game. So this is what makes uh, part of the reason the game feel is so difficult to talk about because if I play this game with a bunch of uh, toddlers from Nebraska, for example, it's going to be very different than if I play this game with uh, a bunch of tech people from the California Silicon Valley startup, right? So not just and again there's cultural changes in here uh, experiential differences depending on your your history and experience past experiences with games but for example uh, if you're playing with players with analysis paralysis versus players okay with making fast choices and seeing the results this is one of the biggest uh, ways in which i see a designer make an intended experience and then it goes off the rails a little bit. I see this in many tests where uh, often someone will come in with a game, especially coming into now digitally with Tabletop Simulator. Oh, this game I play with my friends in an hour. Uh, and then three hours later <laughs> in the test, right, we're through, uh, or one hour later, we're through a single round and there's 10 rounds in the whole game. Uh, and this is a, a consequence of just the ways in which different people play games is very different. Uh, and for the analysis paralysis, easy choices dichotomy, there's uh, some people just want to do very well. Uh, they want to make the right decisions. They often have uh, a fear of making mistakes. And I, I talk very succinctly about this because this is where I often am in games. I often have analysis paralysis because I want to assess everything, 
make the right choices, understand why I'm doing things. Um, what's interesting is it's often great to test with kids because kids don't have that. So they'll just be like, you can say to them, oh, just put this card over here. It doesn't really matter right now. Like, okay, put this card over here, draw this card, play this card. Because uh, you learn a game by doing it, right? By going through the experiences. Uh, yeah, so how focused individuals are on making their choices can make it a very different experience for the whole group. Uh, whether players are more interested in exploration of the game mechanics or optimizing mechanics. So this ties a little bit into analysis paralysis, but do people just want to, again, have that experience in a cake making game, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to collect some sugar cubes and some flour cubes. I'm going to throw it in, make a cake, see what happens. Or do they want to sit there and min-max and really uh, puzzle out the best things to do? And if you have those players playing with each other or like all exploration people versus all thinky people, then it's going to be a different experience. Uh, whether an individual player gets lucky or unlucky, right, in a game with high uh, randomization, it can be a very different experience depending on uh, whether they get certain cards or certain die rolls. Uh, and then of course, outside factors can have a huge impact on how someone experiences a game. Someone, the exact same group, could play the exact same game uh, with the exact same people and have a very different experience, which is tough, right? Like, you could play with your friends, you're on vacation, you're relaxed, uh, you have infinite time, and you could have a great experience. And then you play with the same friends, you're at home, uh, you have to go to work tomorrow, you're stressed out, you have things going on with your family, uh, and it's a different experience, right? So whether people are tired or hungry, uh, everything else that's going on in the bigger bubble, outside the context. Uh, and this, you can't control for that, right? You can't include a Snickers bar in every copy of the game, right? And uh, make sure no one's ever hungry playing your game. So it's just important to uh, play test in different situations and kind of just understand that those things can have an impact uh, and design for them, test for them. All right, I realize I missed some comments over here, so I'm going to go through. <laughs> Pam says, this talk is making me realize that I design from a feel or experience perspective rather than theme or mechanics. Me too, right? This is, I'm so happy to hear you say that because uh, I think I think a lot of people do, um, but I don't often hear it talked about. So it's something that we can kind of surface and explore. <laughs> uh, Danielle, Danielle says, I go between theme and feel. I try to make the themes rich. I love that. Molly says, I don't know. I mean, the toddlers I played with in Omaha were super tech savvy. Yeah, that's totally fair. Helena said it out. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Pam, or hangry. Yeah, hangry is my uh, mode a lot of the time. So that's something I have to think I have to keep in mind as I'm playing games. All right. Oh, I'm going to check on. Have about seven or so minutes. Cool. We're making good time. I didn't run through this beforehand, so I was worried that it would be either too long or too short, but we're almost perfectly on time. So happy about that. All right. So those are the four aspects, I think, that really feed into game feel or game experience, tone, aesthetic, mechanics, theme, and then shifting experience slash outside factors. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting about theme and experience is the experience curve or how game feel changes over time over the course of one play of a game. Uh, most games have an experience curve, right? The way you feel when you're learning the rules versus the way you feel when you're just getting started or making your first moves versus how you feel in the middle, and then after the game is over. Um, most games, I'd say most good games, they have uh, ups and downs along that. Uh, you can map out the curve of experience. You know, it's kind of like, oh, it's like exciting and lots of stuff going on. And then the denouement where it's kind of coming down, you're wrapping things up. Uh, or it could be flat, you know, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then all of a sudden like, whoo, spike up right at the end. Uh, or it could just be for every round. It's just like, oh, it's exciting, 
and then it comes back down. So it's exciting, we're guessing, and then it's come back down. Uh, so it's different shapes that experience curve can take. A couple of examples of experience curves. Jenga. The tower becomes less stable over time. So there's rising tensions. You know, when you start out, it's very solid. You feel very comfortable. Those first few move, moves, there's not a lot of fear, usually, depending on uh, how stable you're feeling on any particular day. But as the tower gets taller, you know, there's definitely the buildup. So that's very much a rising tension and then crash, right? Uh, look at game, a recent game called Gizmos, where you're an uh, engine building game where you're getting marbles and building things up over time. You get more and more options as the game progresses and you have that wealth of choice and abilities, right? Uh, so you have more to think about, more to consider. So the game kind of uh, s slows down in the way, but you, you feel kind of like a swelling power and you like do these crazy combos uh, as the game goes on. In Tiny Towns, game we have a grid, you're putting cubes down, you have less and less space to work with over time. So your well-laid plans either come to fruition or fall apart. So this is a game with, uh, with tension, kind of limitation of options, right? You're, you're, there's a dwindling sense to it. So it's, it kind of comes I would say it starts up here and kind of over time you like goes goes down until eventually you just don't have any options left. Um, so yeah, when you're designing and trying to put feelings and experiences into your game, it's important to keep in mind that it's not just one feeling, right? It's not just uh, everyone up and shouting all the time and like slapping cards or whatever, or everyone just sitting there and thinking, and then I move a thing. Um, I, I would say your experience curve shouldn't be flat. So it's important to think about time, time progressing, how people feel. So how do you assess game feel? You know, how do you figure out what your game feels like to other people? It's almost impossible to self test for this because you know the experience that you're trying to create, right? If I say like, oh, this is going to be a game where uh, there's a lot of excitement and I'm like moving around the table. It's a real time uh, physical body movement game. And this is how it feels like to play. You really need to play test it with other people to ensure that your design intentions come through when they, again, hit the mashup with the unpredictable messiness of the human experience. So some ways we're all playtesters here. Uh, I'm sure most of us have had the experience of playtesting. But if you're looking to playtest specifically for feel, there's some ways you can tweak what you're doing. So, for example, watch facial expressions and body language for uh, concentration. You know, someone's like sitting here and they're really focused. Uh, distraction, you know, someone's on your phone. Uh, again, these are all open to interpretation, so don't read too much into it. Uh, it's still good to ask people questions, but these are just one vector, right, the, of things that you can observe. Uh, are they happy? You know, do they get a thing? They're like, oh my gosh, I got this thing. I got these, I got puppies. I just like, I'm collecting puppies. I'm just like really happy the whole time. Um, one thing that's great for this is recording video with permission, because uh, you can take notes while it's happening, but if you can actually film people, uh, then you can go back and look at the exact moment that they were having those emotions as revealed on their faces uh, and their bodies, right? Uh, Playtest with non-designers. Non this is a great way, a great thing to do in general, but specifically for game feel because non-designers are more likely to describe their experience in terms of how they felt during the game. You know, like, oh, I hated this part. Like, they took all my stuff and I, I built it up and it was really frustrating for me. Or on the other side of that, right? Yeah, I got to take all their stuff and I had all this stuff and it was really exciting for me. Uh, yeah, non-designers, uh, if you're test testing with designers, it's great, uh, but they're often going to dig more into the math and the mechanics of it. Uh, specifically ask how players felt during a particular part of the game. So like, you know, I saw that you did this, um, you, you can even speak to their, their reaction. Like you looked, that you were really focused when you were doing this. What were you feeling in that moment? 
So you can ask verbally, you can also provide written questionnaires that includes questions about the game feeling. Uh, it can be hard to talk about feelings, which I'm going to get to just as I'm wrapping up in a few minutes here. So sometimes you need to couch your questions along the lines of uh, what was your favorite part? What was your least favorite part? Why? And use language that kind of pulls out those feeling words because uh, some people can be uncomfortable talking about their feelings. All right. So yeah, that's, that's all my thoughts I have about game feel. Again, it's something that feels very new to me and something I'm still trying to find the language for. And uh, I could see it taking a long time to really put all these thoughts into words. So I'm excited that you all have joined me for this. I have a few thoughts to tie everything together uh, and then we'll go into questions if anyone has questions about what we talked about today. So game feel or however you want to describe it should absolutely be something you design for, test for, and pitch as part of your game. Uh, the game industry is changing and we're getting more and more players playing games. Uh, people have less time, you know, now that we're stuck at home, more time in some ways, but as time progresses, people usually, and new people come in, more of the newer players have less time to learn, have less patience or tolerance for very complex things. Um, we're playing a lot of games digitally now, so that's a factor as well. But for this new wave of people coming into board games, feel is very important. You know, these, these aren't people, for the most part, a lot of the newcomers into the game hobby aren't people who are coming in here for, like, very thinky mathematical experiences. Some of them absolutely are. But a lot of people are, are kids, they're their families, you know, they're their parents with not a lot of time. So they're looking to have a, a cohesive experience. I get in there, I feel a certain thing, I know what that feeling is going to be, and then I finish and I'm done with it. Uh, so I think more and more going into the future, really capturing uh, a cohesive experience with game design is going to be very valuable. Uh, if you want to, you can test, uh, you can design for feelings and you can test it. And so this is something you can use data for. Test it, uh, track everything that I mentioned before, and you can see how mechanical, thematic, or tone changes to your game impact the feel and the experience. Uh, so specifically observe and take notes between two versions of the game. You know, make one version of the game that's very colorful. Make one version of the game that's uh, completely in black and white and just see how people experience that. Make a very funny version of the game. Make a very serious version of the game and see what the experience is. These are things that you can design uh, and get feedback from specifically. So yeah, some feelings from different from one version to the next. If this version was more exciting than the last one. My heart was pounding, you know? You can get that very specific emotional feedback. Uh, learn to interpret feedback in terms of feel or dig into feelings during feedback. So if someone says, for example, like, what did you think of the game? Whatever questions you're asking during playtesting. I didn't have a lot of options. You know, that could mean I felt powerless, or it could mean I felt comfortable that I didn't, that I could make the right choice because I didn't have an overwhelming number of options. You can dig into some of the feeling language for that. Uh, when you play other people's games, check in with how you're feeling during the game and even take notes at particular points to assess your personal experiential curve. One of the best ways to learn how to design games is to play games, you know, and if you, uh, my local group, back when we were still meeting in person, we had this thing called Board Game Book Club, where we would play games, publish games with designers and talk about our experiences with them. And that's a great way to really see, uh, find out what kind of mechanics make you feel certain ways, make other people feel certain ways. Uh, yeah, great, great education and fun, fun and educating, right? Play, publish games. Last but not least, uh, I didn't want to end on one caveat. And this, as you've been listening to this talk, I'm interested to see if this uh, rankled anyone or if they kind of had this going on in the back of their minds. Using the words 
feel or feeling can be tough with some designers and players. For example, I felt powerless when other players attacked me and I didn't have any ways to defend myself. I have found in my own feedback sessions when I use the word feel and feelings, it can be met with some resistance. Uh, I feel, <laughs> I feel right, I keep saying it. This is something that comes up with uh, being a woman or at least not being a man. You know, this, we, we talk about limiting our talk of feelings and you know maybe sometimes in some situations it's not right to talk about feelings i think for board game design though it's it is something that we should feel comfortable talking about it's something that we should normalize as a conversation that we can have if we only use language talking about winning or losing talking about the math of the game talking about the strategies of the game we miss out on this whole aspect of what makes people enjoy games you know it could be mechanically a very similar game, but the feel could be different based on theme or tone or aesthetic or who you play with. And that's, it feeds back into the product nature of it and the people who are going to buy it, it feeds back into how people are going to review the game. Uh, a lot of people are going to rely on their feelings to make those choices in what they buy and what they recommend to their friends in the feedback they give publicly for a game. So I think it's a conversation that's not always easy to have. Um, it's something that I'm trying to normalize in my own groups and my own play tests. I think that it's worth it. I'm excited to keep talking about this because I think there might be some better language to it. Maybe feel isn't the right word, maybe experience is a better word, but yeah, this is all still very experimental and very new. Uh, it's important and I'm excited to talk about it more with you all, learn about it more, and for to develop the language around it so it's something that we can share and talk about. All right, that's all that I have. Uh, let me see what I have here in the chat. Pam says, I like to ask, did any part of the game make you feel frustrated? Yes, frustration, very much an experience and feeling in the game, which isn't bad. You know, sometimes frustration, again, value judgments there. Frustration is an important part of a game, uh, but it's good to know when it is happening. Also, was there any part of the game you wanted to do more of? Ooh, yes. <laughs> I love that you say that because one of the things I say all the time, I don't know if it makes sense to anyone who's not me, uh, I want to do the stuff of the game. I just want to do the thing. If you, if you tell me that I can make a huge mountain of meeples, I want to make a mountain of meeples. I'm like, okay, this is a meeple mountain game. And then over here, you're like, okay, but you can't make the Meeple Mountain until you do this math problem. Like, but, but I wanna, I wanna mount, I wanna mountain the Meeples over here. It's like, no, you can't do that. You gotta do math. So I'm over here doing the math, like looking at the Meeple Mountain. Saying, like, I wanna do the thing that you said that I could do that I was excited about. Molly says, wow, I wish I'd heard this before we finalized our first game. Uh oh. Uh, it, it's a process, right? The, we're always learning. Two years from now, I'm sure that I would give this talk in a very different way. Uh, Pam says, what are your views on games that intentionally elicit negative feelings, sadness, grief, etc.? Should they include aspects that create positive feelings to balance it out? Um, I, I believe very strongly in a experience curve so that you're feeling different things over the course of the game. If a game is just, uh, and, and I re relate this to fiction, I was going to talk about this but didn't. I think that uh, storytelling has a lot of this experience language that we don't have yet for board games. So if you think about a book or a movie, right, it's like, oh, things are not great and then things get worse and, oh, and wait, now things are awful and Oh wait, maybe it's okay. No, things are just totally bad the whole time. Maybe some people like that. I don't personally like that. I guess you could call it an experience curve. It's not my favorite. Uh, I like some resolution, right? So with uh, the game, the wait, I haven't had a chance to read through the book yet, but at a certain point, this person is going to pass on, right? So there is a tension and release to it. I think it's important to have both aspects or 
uh, my storytelling game, and then we died, right? You're playing the cards, you're talking about what led up to your death, and then eventually everyone dies. It's funny because it's not usually not a sad game, <laughs> it's usually a humorous game, but I like having uh, a little bit of back and forth there. And, and playtesting, I think, will really come out here if you can find your true target audience there. Um, it's a little tough to talk about because I haven't played enough games that really make me... I get angry and frustrated mechanically about things, but make me feel uh, like emotionally just mad, for, like thematically mad, or sadness. Uh, I've, I've tried some of these games that are supposed to be a little supposed to capture the emotional feeling of sadness and I haven't really felt sadness in the game so yeah I think I, there needs to be more stuff out there and playing those games we can experience be like oh this is how they use sadness thematically and mechanically and aesthetically in the game and starting from that base I think as we get more of those sorts of games it will be easier to build on that uh, and find out what the right doses of that in a game are. <laughs> Molly says, I love Magic Maze in part because it stresses me out. Oh my gosh, yeah. The real-time nature of the game and just sitting there. Uh, also, Magic Maze is a great example of a game because it the experience varies very much so versus whether you play two players or four players or six or eight players. Uh, Two-player game, it's a very intense kind of stare you down uh, optimization sort of a game. Whereas if you play it at four or six players, uh, especially in a party environment, it's more like chaos, hey, we're probably not gonna win, everybody's moving everything, and, oh, excuse me, just trying to keep track of everything that's going on in the board and more of a chaos experience to it. All right, I think that's all we have for questions. We have a couple minutes left. If anyone has anything left, that they would like to ask. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm very excited about this topic. Uh, really want to continue to dig more into it. Still thinking about ways that I can do that. So if you ever want to talk about this on Facebook, you can friend me. I'm very active on Twitter, at Emma Larkins. Um, I used to talk about this more in live streams and Twitch. I haven't been doing that lately, but I'm trying to figure out a way that I can do more talks around this sort of a subject. Um, yeah, so you can find me here on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter and talk to me there. I'm at Emma Larkins pretty much everywhere. And yeah, that's all we got for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, very excited to talk here on the Board Game Broads live Facebook, live Facebook stream. Uh, we have shows here on a fairly regular basis, so it's fun doing a talk here, but I'm also excited to see more of what you all have to talk about. Uh, yeah, it's been great. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to download and upload this video in case you want to check it out in the future. Yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Pam. Molly, I think glad you enjoyed the talk. Talk to you all soon.